We're going to turn in our Bibles tonight to the book of Genesis in chapter 6. Genesis in chapter 6, and we're going to begin in verse 1. Genesis chapter 6 and verse 1. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and the da and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair. And they took them wives of all which they chose, and the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive or plead with man. For that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, they bare children to them, and the same became mighty men, which were men of renown or famous men. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generation. And Noah walked with God. And Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh, or all people, had corrupted their way upon the earth. And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make thee an ark of gopher wood, room shalt thou make in the ark, and shall pitch it within and without. Come down to verse 22, chapter 6. Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. And the Lord said to Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark. For thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Verse 16. And they that went in, went in male and female of all flesh, as God had commanded Noah. And the Lord shut him in. Amen. We know God will bless the public reading of God's infallible and inerrant truth. Let's bow together in prayer, please. Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your precious and inerrant word. We want to thank you, loving Father, for the help and the conscious awareness in these days of the hovering and the working of the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Lord, that you have cause to come down, Lord, and you wish to come down further, and you wish to manifest your power in a wonderful way. And Lord, we do not want to offend or hurt or grieve you. So we pray as we humble ourselves before the mighty God of heaven, that, Lord, you would find in our hearts humility and a desire to know God better, a willingness to obey. And we pray, Lord, that you would speak to us, your people, tonight, and those that are not saved, that they would, Lord, hear the call of God in their heart, and that the fear of God would lay hold upon them, and that conviction of sin would grip them. And that, Lord, by your great spirit, truth, and love, that you would save them, now we again, in Jesus' name, take authority over every plan of the enemy. We take authority in Jesus' name over any individual, any person, Lord, that is involved in, Lord, doing things that the enemy would want them to do. And we take authority over that in Jesus' name. And we pray, Lord, that you'll put a hedge around this place. And we pray, Lord, that you'll confuse all the plans of Satan. And every tool, even it be a Christian, even a Christian, Lord, that he would choose to use and have to use, that even they would recognize, Lord, their need. So we pray and we thank you for all you're going to do 
In Jesus' name, amen and amen. I want to speak to you for a little time this evening on the days of Noah. When the Lord Jesus was on earth, he talked about the days of Lot. But he also talked about the days of Noah. There are many today who don't believe in the days of Noah. They don't believe there was a flood. In fact, many educated people believe it was all a joke. And there was nothing really serious about that. But if you were to look at the evidence, as many scientists do, who are unbiased and unprejudiced in evolutionary thought, there is ample evidence that there was a great flood that covered all the earth, and that many animals are still discovered embedded by a sudden and a horrific event that buried them while they were alive all over the earth at the one time. As I say, without prejudice, the evidence is there, and there are many Christian scientists that believe. But I wouldn't lean even on the word of a Christian scientist. I would believe the words of Jesus. Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be. Jesus believed in Noah. Jesus can't lie. He said, I am the truth. And the truth can never lie. Let me paint a simple picture for you the best I can with what it was like between the great flood and at the beginning when God created the earth and created man, sun, moon, stars, and sky. Originally, there was no rain on the earth. God fed the, uh, the uh, plants and the animal kingdom through rivers and through mist. A mist came down, and that was how everything got irrigation and was fed. And then, surrounding the earth, there was no north or south polar cap, but the earth was in like a massive greenhouse. And everything really grew quickly and grew well, and it's one of the reasons why, scientifically, that people could live so long, because many of the rays that come in from the sun today, ultraviolet, do create numerous problems. But that was all dealt with at that time. There was a, a canopy, a cloak, right around the globe. And so the globe was a wonderful place, like a great greenhouse where people could live, and it was a beautiful place that God had created. But the Bible tells us, despite the fact that God had made this beautiful world and created man and put man upon it, we know in the Garden of Eden that Adam and Eve sinned against God. They were disobedient. They did not believe what God said. They didn't have big Bibles. They just had very little, actually, that God had spoken to them, but they didn't believe what God said. And that's nothing new for people not to believe what God says. You see, friends, the evidence of a man not believing God is how he lives. It's how he lives. How you live determines whether you believe God exists or not. In fact, there's something worse, actually, than being an atheist. Did you know that? It's being religious, but living as though you are an atheist. <laughs> living as though there is no God that sees you. Living as if there is no accountability and no day of judgment. Living as though your thought life is not under the scrutiny of heaven, and that the angels watch you all the time and know every secret and everything that's hidden, it's all open to heaven. The Bible says that sin entered into the human race 
And the Bible says that when sin entered, then there was a grieving of God. God was so grieved at the fall of Adam, but he loved mankind, and he still does. And so God set up a rescue operation, even at that early stage. And he, he said to Adam, Adam, you'll have to come back to me. I want to win you back from your sin, but you'll have to come through a blood sacrifice. And this was pointing forward, even in the Garden of Eden, to the day when God's own Son, Jesus Christ, would be offered as the Lamb of God for the sin of the world. And this little lamb, we presume, was taken, or a sheep, and it was killed, and God killed it, and he taught them that they would have to kill the lamb, and then he covered them with its skin because they had no clothing then after their sin. They probably had a clothing of light before that, as God's presence was upon them. But once they sinned, that clothing of light was gone, and they were naked, and they tried to cover themselves with fig leaves. But God said, this is no use. Your own covering is no good. All your religion, all the good works, all the rituals, God says, all our righteousnesses are filthy rags in the sight of God. God said, you'll have to come my way, and it's by the shedding of blood and it is by the receiving of the covering or a righteousness from that sacrifice. And Adam did that. And he taught his children that way, and they taught their children. And for several generations, this continued right up to Noah. But while God was encouraging Noah and his descendants to go the way of sacrifice and blood sacrifice and trust in God and repent of their sin. There were many who didn't want to do that, didn't want to repent, didn't want to, to deal with sin. Sin's enjoyable. Sin's enjoyable. Go out to the world tonight. Talk to the people at work tomorrow. Sin's enjoyable. But my friends, what happened was that as they sinned, they went deeper and deeper and darker and darker. The Bible says that sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. The more you sin, the more you will be bound by sin. The more you commit a sin, the more addictive that sin becomes. And not only does it lead you to addiction of that particular sin, but then it leads you into another sin. You see, man is a fallen creature, but man is a falling creature. And without God, man is always on the trajectory downwards, always. Man can't be lifted. You can't educate man up. Man is a fallen and a falling creature. And it's interesting that when man falls, the Bible says he goes down to hell. Keeps falling. And then whenever man has fallen into hell for the sin he has committed in rebellion against heaven and light, then the Bible says that he falls into a bottomless pit where he keeps falling. You see, the trajectory of man in sin is always further and further and further from God. Even in hell itself, man goes further and further and further from God. Is the road you're on the right road? I want to tell you for four simple reasons, if you're not a Christian, why I wouldn't be in your shoes. Four simple reasons. First of all, I wouldn't be in your shoes even for a moment because I might die in that moment and be in your shoes, so I wouldn't want to be in them. But here's why I wouldn't want to be in them, because there could be 10 or 20 or 30, 40, right up the committee, or 90 years of sin behind you. And that's unaccounted for yet. And I would have to face all that. All your sins behind you. There's a judgment, the Bible says, ahead of you. 
saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open. I wouldn't want to be in your shoes knowing that I would go to the great white throne judgment and there be be dealt with as my sin were brought before God and then justice were done against me. I wouldn't want to be in your shoes with your sin behind you and with your judgment in front of you, nor would I want to be in your shoes because of an angry God above you. Because God is angry with the wicked every day. You say, I didn't feel his anger today, Alan. No, you didn't, because you're dead in trespasses and sin. Because you're separated from God and you don't hear his voice. You see, you're dead to God. You're cut off from God. You enjoy the blessings of God. You enjoy food and life and a heart beating and a family, all those blessings. But God himself is cut off from you through sin. And so God is angry with you because you live as though he doesn't exist. You don't regard him or the sacrifice of his son, or you don't regard or thank him for the life that he has given you. But you live as though it is yours as of right. You have no accountability to him, whatever. So you see, you have all your sin behind you. You have, an, you have a judgment in front of you. You have an angry God above you, and you're walking on a tightrope, and it could break at any moment, and you would fall into the belly of hell beneath you. You see, you can understand why I wouldn't want to be in your shoes, even you're the greatest millionaire. I wouldn't take place. I wouldn't envy you. I wouldn't covet you. I wouldn't want anything of you. Because I know exactly where you stand. Do you know where you stand? Do you know that's your position? Well, God looked down in the days of Noah, and God says that something unusual was happening. These sons of God, it says, came in to the daughters of men. Now, there's contention by scholars over it, but I tend to the view that these angelic beings somehow either became or invaded the personality of men, one way or the other. And they had relationships with women, and they took these women who were beautiful, and they literally snatched them away from their families, and they had children to them. And the Bible says that the children born were giants, or Nephilim, it means fallen ones. They were what we would call hybrids. They were half demonic, half human. Had they got a proper soul? I don't know. All I know is that something happened at that point with this invasion, this fall, this, this, these beings that fell from heaven at that time, a number of them, and came down to earth. And they did this, and something was created. Something came on the earth. And these giants came, men of renown. They were, they were notorious for evil, and they were notorious for their size. They were on the earth. So the days of Noah were days of angelic lawlessness, when they, these creatures were lawless, and they, they did things that were totally contrary to nature. Because God never intended that the angelic realm would have any kind of intercourse in that way with the humans. It wasn't to be, but... But they violated the rules. And the Bible says in Peter that God dealt with them and he put them in a place called Tartarus, hell. It's a compartment within hell where they are chained and they have been there and they're there tonight. And they are chained there and retained there to the final judgment. Because let me tell you, friends, God deals with sin. God deals with sin. Not only was it a time of angelic lawlessness, but a time of divine restriction. You see, the Bible says that these um, sons of God came in and they took the women. And then the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that his days also are his flesh, and his days shall be in 120 years. Again, there's a little bit of debate with theologians over this. I'm not getting into that. 
But what I'm saying is that some say the 120 years was the shortening of the lifespan of man to 120. Others take the view it was 120 years to the flood. Either way, I'm not going to argue that. But what I am going to say, what's clear in the text, that God's patience was running out. That's what I'm saying. God's patience was running out. Now, there are times when God's patience runs out with a nation runs out with a world, or runs out with an individual. This is the most cataclysmic event that occurred in the Old Testament. This is the biggest. It's the biggest event of an intervention by God where his patience ran out, and God literally de dealt with the entire earth, which at that stage was anything between maybe 15 to 100 million people. And God said, I've had enough. Now you say, well, that was an awful event to happen. Yes, it was. It happened in the regions of Sodom and Gomorrah where God did the same. But it happens every day, friends. It happens every day. It has happened in your town land. It has happened in your village. You just didn't know. You just heard a man had died. You just heard somebody passed away. No, 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 no. There comes a point where God says, my spirit shall not strive with man anymore. He will not repent. He will not turn. And my patience has now gone. You see, friends, the Bible says, wicked men shall not live out half their days. And in our land, with all its bloodshed over 30 or 40 years, we're aware of many instances where people took up the gun and people were engaged in things they shouldn't have been. But many of them went to a youthful grave. And they would still be alive today had they not given themselves to wickedness. But the Bible says, not in all cases, but the general principle... Wicked men shall not live out all their days. The Bible says, Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. They that sow to the flesh shall of the flesh reap destruction. They that sow to the Spirit shall reap life. God says something remarkable in verse 5. God saw that the wickedness on the earth was great and that every imagination of the thoughts of man's heart was only evil continually. I want to tell you something if you don't know it already, that God reads your thoughts. All those unclean thoughts. All those perverse thoughts. All those embarrassing thoughts. All those dark secretive thoughts. He reads them all. And he has them all. Jesus said in the Old Testament it says. Whosoever commits adultery will come under the judgment of the law. But Jesus said if a man looks on a woman to lust after her in his heart. In God's sight he has already committed adultery in his heart. So at the judgment... It's as though you've done the deed. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. From within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, a deceitful eye, pride, lasciviousness, all these evil things come from within and defile the man. My friend, you're defiled. We are all defiled by sin. It separates us from a holy God who lives in light and lives in truth and cannot look on sin. God couldn't look upon the earth at any more. He said he was grieved at Humanity, he was grieved and hurt. 
The wickedness was great. And then it says also that the earth was corrupt in verse 12. It was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted their own way. They had corrupted themselves. Do you know what corrupt means? As God looked on humanity, God looked on a heaving mass of people moving around the earth, doing their daily business, their chores, their homes, their families. As God looked on the earth at that time, God said this thing is like a rotting carcass. It's a rotting carcass. There's a foul smell rising from humanity, rising from government, rising from the laws of the people. And God says, I can't take it anymore. Has man changed? No man is bound to sin. Man is a fallen being and a falling being. You see, dear friends, God looked down on man and essentially what he said with that word corrupt was he said, they have become good for nothing. I can't see any way of changing this. I can't see any redemption. I can't see any salvation for these people. They have gone so far in their wickedness. They're so perverse. And interestingly, in Peter, the apostle Peter in his little book at the end of the Bible he talks about these fallen creatures that came down to earth in the days of Noah. And he said they left their habitation and they had this unnatural intercourse with this woman. And then he said it was likened to Sodom and Gomorrah, where again there was unnatural behavior going on. Homosexuality, same thing. Unnatural. My dear friends, man hasn't changed. Listen. Homosexuality and such sin is not new. It's not new, and the celebration of it with flags is not new. It happened in Sodom and Gomorrah. If they had had rainbow flags, they would have had them. It's nothing new. Man has always been a sinner. Man has always been broken and fragmented, and, and he has been so destroyed by his sin. The Bible says that the earth was covered with violence. The statistics for violence today in our province and in our land is unbelievable. Abuse in homes. Not only physical abuse where one is abusing the other, but also sexual abuse. The number of cases that I have dealt with where older men and women have come to tell me of a father or an uncle or a relative or a friend of the parents where they abused them sexually, it is absolutely astounding. And it's driven by the devil because it breaks those lives, those people's lives are broken. And as a result of whether it's physical or whether it's sexual or emotional or even verbal abuse, my, my dear friend, mother or father, don't speak ill against your child. Don't tell them they're no use. The devil will take that word and it'll insert them deep in their heart and that child will suffer all their life. I have seen grown men sitting crying because of what their father said to them when they were a wee child. Never got over it. Not only was it a problem for them to get over emotionally, but spiritually the devil had an arrow in them. And it had to be removed from them so that they could begin to really enjoy God. Verbal abuse. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. Be careful what you say. Be careful what you say. Whenever you speak out foul words and lying words in the heavens, as God looks down, it's like vomit coming out of you, whether you're a Christian or not. That's why the Bible says whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue or praise, think on these things. 
And it's good to pray, Lord, put a guard on my mouth. It's good to pray every day, Lord, please help me with my tongue because it's the most unruly member in our bodies. Help me with my tongue, Lord. Very quickly, the call of Noah. God called him. And the reason he called him wasn't because he was the wealthiest man or the wisest man or the bravest man. He simply called him because he was a righteous man. And he was perfect before God. That doesn't mean he was perfect sinless. It means that he was blameless before God. The motives of his heart was pure. He wanted to honor God in his life. He wanted to please God. And he lived in this place where these giants were. And where people thought nothing but wickedness and evil and perversion was rampant on the earth. And listen, in the midst of that darkness, a man stood alone and he loved the Lord. And you can love the Lord and walk with the Lord and have a family that fear the Lord in the midst of a world that hates the Lord. There's grace sufficient to do that. And he loved the Lord and the Lord spoke to him. And the Lord said, I want you to build a big ark. It was the biggest ever act of faith that a man undertook in the Old Testament. He had never seen rain. There had never been an outflow of water like that ever. And God came to him and spoke to him in the midst of his job, whatever it was, as he feared the Lord. And God said, Noah, I'm going to send a great flood. And I want you to build a big boat, 450 foot long and about 75, 80 foot wide and 40 foot high. I want you to build that. And my friend, only on the strength of God's word did Noah begin a project that would last anything up to 100 years and no rain. That was queer faith. Boy, he believed God when God spoke. He never moved from it. He never doubted when they all came round and laughed at him and said, what an under goodness is wrong with this old boy? 550 odd years of age with his three sons and few others probably employed. And my friends, he believed God. He believed God. He believed the word of God. I want to tell you tonight, I believe the word of God. I believe God exists, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I believe there's a day coming for the judgment of the wicked when all the wicked dead will meet the Lord and the wicked who are on the earth will have to give an account of deeds done in the body, whether they're good or evil. I believe that when men die, they either go to heaven through faith in Jesus Christ or they arrive suddenly, catastrophically in hell the moment they die and there is no recourse or no escape from that place. I believe that. Why? Because Jesus Christ believes it. Why would I believe some boy on television, Sky News, or BBC, or anything else? Why would I believe David Attenborough? Why would I believe some scientist in Cambridge? Why would I believe some great academic when Jesus Christ alone is the truth? He alone is the truth. I believe the truth. Say, why do you believe it, Alan? I believe it because it's in the Word of God. I believe it because Jesus Christ dwells inside me. I feel Him. I know Him. I have known Him since I was a teenager. And I know the reality of His presence in my life. I know He exists. I have seen far too much in my life already to doubt or even to begin to doubt that Jesus Christ is alive. And that the Word of God is true. God called him, he started the shipbuilding, and he started to preach. But you know, as he preached, nobody was interested. <laughs> Maybe we're preaching tonight, and you leave this venue tonight, you say. <laughs> Maybe you say, I'll not do believe it, actually, but not for now. I have too much I want to do in my life. You know, my mom and my dad, they're into that, but you're there, they're like dinosaurs. <laughs> Just the way they are, but I have my own life. Hmm? But what if this was the last night? What if this was the last call? Hmm? Young man from Balamoni many years ago was at an evangelist who was preaching the gospel and the family had come night after night. A great sense of the presence of God was in the midst, just like tonight. Great sense of the presence of God was in the midst. And the preacher preached that night and he got unusual help from the Lord. And preachers can tell if they're worth their salt and they're walking with God. They can tell sometimes what God's doing. God will reveal it to them while they're preaching. Show you things about people. Show you things over people. And this particular night when the meeting was over, 
This man was going out, a young fella in his teens, with lovely, lovely, uh, wavy ginger hair. As he was going out of the meeting, the evangelist felt an unusual attraction in drawing to this young man. He stopped him at the door. The little lad was embarrassed, and he said to him, Son, would you not come to Christ? He felt the hand pulling away from him as though embarrassed and certainly not wanting to engage the evangelist. And he got his hand away and slipped out. Not tonight. Mother and daughter, both Christians. But young man, not tonight. Next day he was in the yard doing some welding. Mother and daughter were in the kitchen with huge windows into them. Suddenly they saw a flash of light. And they looked out and there a son and brother was lying in the yard, his body fitting with electricity pump pumping through his body. They ran out. His sister went to touch him and the mother said, no, don't touch him. He's gone. Oh yes, my friend, the old must die. But the young may die. Don't be thinking that you're guaranteed tomorrow. Boast not thyself of tomorrow. Thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. You see, my dear friends, he turned away. He turned away. Don't turn away. Don't turn away. Don't reject the Lord. Come to him. Finally, the salvation of Noah. Noah built this great ark, and after all those years of building and preaching, the Lord said, Noah, into the ark. And he got into this great building. God had brought the animals. God draw them, drew them. And then they went. They got into the ark for seven days. And the Bible says that the Lord shut the door. When God shuts the door, it can't be opened. If God shuts the door on you, you can't be saved. Now I want you to get something as we draw to the close. I want you always to remember this. Don't ever think that you can get saved whenever you want. Don't ever think that I'll just decide that I'll get saved at the last minute and I'll call on the Lord. Many years ago, when we first got a telephone, I had a niece, she was about four or five. She walked in one day to the phone just been a child, and she lifted the phone, and she began to talk into it. I walked into her, and I said, dear, there's nobody there. And she said, hello, yes, thank you. And she was doing all her talking. I said, there's nobody there. And she said, don't shh. Yes. I said, there's nobody there. She got really angry, and she threw the phone down. She says, how did you know there was nobody there? I said, it didn't ring. It didn't ring. Reverently speaking, you can only get saved when God rings. My spirit shall not always strive with man. I'll not always come near. But the Bible says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Is he near? He says, call on me when I'm near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him turn to the Lord and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. You see, friends, the door was narrow. And the Bible says when Jesus was on the earth in Galilee speaking to the people, this is what he said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. He said, narrow is the way that leadeth to life, and few there be that find it. But broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Jesus said, I am the door. I'm the way. He's the way to heaven. You come through him. 
And he invites you tonight because I want to tell you in closing that God so loved this world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should never perish but have everlasting life. And God loves you and he wants to save you. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He has no death in the wicked, pleasure in the death of the wicked, but they turn from their way and live. I remember in Bible college many years ago, the late Mary Peckham, who was saved in the Lewis revival, came and lectured to us. And she told us the story of how she was preaching one time in Stornoway, up in the Western Isles, out in the Western Isles where my wife's from. And she said, as her and another young pilgrim were speaking for the faith mission, she said, we were standing and all the young men and women were on their way to the dances and they were on their way to the places of amusement on a Sunday evening or a Saturday evening. And she was speaking and she said, I felt so compelled by the Lord to quote a verse. And she said, at the top of my voice, I cried out, turn ye, O oh, turn ye, for why will ye die? O house of Israel, for I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from their way and live. Turn ye, O oh, turn ye, for why will ye die? I said to you, my friend, tonight, turn. Turn, repent. Turn from your sin. Let go of your sin. Abandon your sin. Say goodbye to your sin. Abandon it, my friend, lest it take you into hell. And there in hell you cry out that it's too late. Like the men at the door of Noah's ark when they shouted, let us in. But there was no way back in. God had shut the door. The Lord Jesus loves you so much. that He went to the cross of Calvary and there he died on your behalf. He took your punishment on his body so that you could be forgiven. And even though there's so much sin in your heart and your mind and your spirit, God loves you. Christ has died for you. And God would love to rescue you. He would love to forgive you. I want to tell you that the people of God are pulling for you here. They're praying for you here. They're crying for you here. Angels are here pulling for you. The Holy Spirit is pulling for you. You couldn't be in a better place to get right with God. Couldn't be. You'll know if he's speaking to you. You can always tell when God's speaking. It's like a civil war starts inside your ribs. And all hell says, get out. Get home. Forget about it. Shake this out of your mind. Don't let the, this. Is, this is nonsense. I, my friend, the devil is a voice. And you'll know it whenever you start to move toward God. Boy, you'll know he exists. Boy, he'll come. Don't you do it. What do your friends think? You couldn't keep it. You couldn't be a Christian. So you wouldn't know how to read a Bible. He'll have a thousand things to throw at you. <laughs> but I want to tell you that Jesus is beside you. And Jesus loves you. And my friend, if you're willing to let him come into your life, he'll help you every step of the way. He says, I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. I'll help you through the journey of life and the trials and burdens of life. And at the end of the journey, he says, I'll take you with me to heaven. And you'll be there for all eternity. Would you come to him tonight? Would you come to the Lord? Many years ago in South Africa, there was a famous aristocrat judge. He had been completely and totally destroyed his reputation by his disgraced son. To the extent that he threw his son out and he says, I never want to see you again. You'll never be back at this house. You've destroyed my reputation and I want nothing more to do with you. You're a disgrace. The son left and vowed never to be back. But after a number of years, his mother began to die. And as she lay in her deathbed, she said to her husband, I have one request before I die. I want to see my son. He said, I'll give you anything, but not that. We can't have him back. 
She said, I want to see my son before I die. Eventually, as he watched his wife dying, he reneged. And he said, very well, I'll invite him back. He sent the message to the son. They didn't have phones. It was just sent by another means. And the message was sent to say, son, your mother is dying. Come home. He sent a reply to said, Father, you said not to come back. How do I know that you'll let me back? Just beneath the great mansion, there was an orchard with trees. The father said, when you come home, son, and as you come on the tree and you will look to the orchard, and a white sheet will be on a tree, and you'll know that I'm welcoming you home. The son got on the train and started the long journey home. And as he was traveling home, he was thinking, I wonder, will he renege? After all, look what I did. Look how I treated him. Will he really welcome me? Will I see the sheet? Which one will it be? Where will it be? And he had so many worries. But when he came around the corner... And looked. The tears filled up in his eyes, for he saw every tree had a sheep. Father's welcomed me home. He wants me back. God wants you back. He wants you back. 